Well, first off, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I've lived across the river for like 11 years now, uh, and uh, I think it was my first time at BU in, in this capacity anyway. Uh, and thanks to Dave uh, for uh, taking me on a tour of Antarctica, which was amazing, and Keith and Alex and Jenny, I was like, I did not expect that. So I just spent the last 45 minutes walking through the dry valleys, which was amazingly cool. So if you haven't seen that, by all means, go hit them up for a tour. It, it's mind blowing. And it's nice to see Wally too, hi Wally. Um, so it is really my great privilege to be here today, and when Jenny told me about this seminar series, I thought, oh my gosh, climate change in the deep sea. There's so little we know, but there's these studies, many, many studies coming out now that are telling us about changes in the deep sea that we are seeing, that we can measure, and that uh, give us pause, right, and lead us to have some concern about how our changing surficial world may be affecting uh, life in the deep sea. And so what I thought I'd do today is start off by telling you that I'm a physiologist. That's how I think about the world. Uh, it's, it, we're, we're physiologists are the people who like to know how things work. Um, if you think of genomics first, genomics folks and bioinformaticists is people who like blueprints. Physiologists are the people who like performance, right? So we're, not, we're interested in understanding not just what an organism has in its repertoire, but how it actually functions. A uh, kind of goofy example I like to use with my students is if you had never seen uh, the blueprints to a car, you'd have be hard pressed to figure out how they might vary, right? And that's kind of what genomes are today. And they're wonderful, and they've taught us a lot about what organisms can and may, you know, may be doing. But don't forget that at least for now, about half the genes we see in any genome are undescribed, right? And for those of us who study gene expression, what genes are being turned on, so often the number one gene that's being upregulated when we change a condition is a hypothetical protein. It's like the nightmare of physiologists, hypothetical protein. Like, what does it even mean? Um, so physiologists are really interested in understanding performance. So back to the blueprint, if I gave you a blueprint of a Ferrari and a Fiat, and you had never seen those two cars before, you might be convinced that they're phylogenetically related or that they're very similar, right? Four wheels, an engine, a steering wheel, a radio, and so on. But really their performance is very different, the way they, the way they handle so on and so forth, and all those other aspects that make them unique in their own right. That's what physiologists try and do as we study organisms in our world. Now, back to climate change. What I'd like to do today is take you on a tour through some of the things that concern physiologists from the point of view of climate change, uh, tell you uh, about four major, or sorry, rather three major um, <clears throat> changes in our uh, ocean world. Uh, tell you a bit about some of the research coming out on those, but I'd also like to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about deep sea mining, which is another thing that is coming up uh, and will likely have uh, an impact on the deep sea and frankly the rest of our ocean. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and dive into this. Uh, I'm going to move through some of these at a decent clip, but um, please stop me if you have any questions. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any, any other uh, questions you might have at the end. But before I get started, um, I wanted to ask you all, what do you know about the deep sea? Anybody want to volunteer some, something that they know about the deep sea? I will, I will gladly uh, pick people. That's fine. I'll start with my friend Wally. It's cold. It's cold. Good answer. It's cold. Yes. High pressure. High pressure. Yep. Cold, high pressure. Yep. Oh, good point. A lot of oxygen and nutrients down there. Yep. Methane hydrates. Methane hydrates, absolutely. Yeah. What else? Dark. dark. Yeah. So dark and more dark. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So um, yeah, so all, those are all true. And in fact, uh, there are many things about the deep sea that we know, and it, but we are still learning. We are still learning more and more. I should actually rephrase that. There are many things about the deep sea that we think we know. And as we begin to study the deep sea more and more, we begin to realize just how uh, many of our conventional challenges are being assumption, uh, uh, challenged each time uh, we, we, we go and do our work. Now, this is the season of fact checking. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to spend a few slides seeing if you all can discern fact from fiction, okay? So uh, indulge me if you will. The deep sea is the biggest habitat on Earth. True or false? Let's see a show of hands for true. Who believes this? Okay, who thinks this is false? 
Okay, few of you do. In fact, the deep sea is the biggest habitat on Earth by volume, right? If you think of the deep sea, if you think of all the habitable volume of our biosphere, the deep sea, and that is the oh, part of the ocean that's below the photic zone, that's, that has no sunlight penetrating it, the deep sea is 80% of our planet's habitable volume. 80%, right? That's the vast majority. Everything else you can think of, deserts, rainforests, lakes, the upper half mile of ocean, every coral reef, all of that fits into the other 20%. It just means it's big, but it doesn't mean it's got a lot of life. It's big, it has a lot of, it has a high diversity of life. It doesn't have as much biomass. You're absolutely true. Yep. But I will bring this up because I wanted to point out that as a habitat, if it represents 80% of our planet's biosphere, one could argue that this is the norm on Earth, not the exception. I want us to change the conversation about how we talk about the deep sea. We always think of it as an extreme environment, but you know, it's the largest part of our habitat. So just, just something to bear in mind, right? If you change the area of this map to represent the deep sea's uh, representation of, uh, or, or portion of our habitat, it, you know, it looks something like this. We are terrestrial beings and we tend to be very terrestrial centric, but in fact, the ocean is immense, right? Okay, second question for you. Average temperature in the deep sea is near freezing. Well, I think we already answered that one, but let's see a show of hands. Who still disagrees with this? <laughs> right? It is true. The average temperature in the deep sea hovers between 1 and 4 degrees Celsius. And that is an interesting attribute of the deep sea. It is cool and it is constantly cool, with the exception of vents and other areas that are really exciting places to work, but not the norm for the deep sea. High pressure. And high pressure, absolutely. Next question. The tallest mountain or volcano in the world is in the Atlantic Ocean. True or false? Who thinks it's true? Ah, I see some little reluctance here. Who thinks this is false? Okay, someone who thinks it's false. Where is the tallest mountain or volcano? Hawaii, Hawaii right? It's Mauna Kea. All right? And it, 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 um, it, it would, it, it would um, surpass Mount Everest, put side by side. Mount Everest hovers around 8,800 and something odd meters. Mauna Kea is 10,200 meters. Right? So it's, uh, that's the biggest mountain, folks. On the seafloor. Sea sea uh, there's an ocean under our ocean. True or false? Well, it's a trick question, so that's what I mean by that. <laughs> what do you mean what I mean by that? So what I mean by that is that I will just go ahead and tell you all that, in fact, there is a giant aquifer under the ocean, and that's strange to think about. It took me a while to wrap my head around this idea, but the oceanic crust is primarily basalt and it's fractured and there's actually an aquifer under the ocean that is immense it holds 20 to 30 million uh, cubic kilometers of water right and the whole ocean recirculates through this aquifer every 70 to 200,000 years it's pretty rough right because we don't have a good sense of that yet Say that number again. 70,000 to 200,000 years sorry a whole ocean circulates through this every 70,000 to 200,000 years. And this aquifer hosts a, a huge number of microbes, right, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Final question, 50% of all volcanic activity takes place in the ocean. True or false? True. true. Who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's false? So those of you who think it's false, why is it false? It's 90%. 90% of volcanic activity <laughs> takes place in. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. I have one more question then for you, and then we'll move on. Uh, is there gold dissolved in seawater? Yes. Sure. How much gold is dissolved in seawater? Anybody know? How much gold is there to give each person on Earth? A uh, milligram? A gram? Several grams? Anybody want to guess? It's about four kilograms, or about nine pounds of gold. There's enough gold dissolved in the ocean that if you could extract it all, you could give each person on earth nine pounds of gold, right? So if you're feeling entrepreneurial and you have a good idea, let me know. But remember, this is the whole ocean. So don't get too excited until you can figure out how to pull, you know, all of the entire ocean through your magical gold extractor. What's the concentration? Anybody? I, I do not know, right? But it's... Uh, I, I can assure you that if it were even remotely commercially viable at this time, someone would be all over this. Now, the, but the deep sea harbors even greater treasures, right, than what we just discussed. It's a, it's a tremendously diverse place, and as this gentleman pointed out, there's not a lot of biomass, right, but there's a tremendous amount of diversity, and I'll touch upon that at the end of the talk again. I wanted to, to quickly show you some of the kinds of creatures that live in the deep sea. 
I spend a lot of my time thinking about these organisms and where they live and how they make a living. Um, and some of you may be familiar with them, but some you may not know about. Now this is a deep sea coral reef, and I'll tell you a little bit more about deep sea corals. But there are many deep sea coral reefs, uh, and they are in a very important part of the, the deep sea ecosystem. They're a place where fish go to have their young, and so on and so forth. There are other strange and wonderful creatures in the deep. Everybody familiar with this? It's an anglerfish, right? Is this a boy or a girl? It's a girl, right? So, because all the big ones are girls. Boys are very, very small, and they stick to the side of females when they find them, and they fuse into them, and they become a floating husband, just like a little appendage. I think sounds pretty good. No, it's all right with me. Anybody know who this is? This is a creature called Phronema. This is the inspiration for the creature in the movie Aliens, right? It is a, it is, it is an, a, a mid-water organism. This lives in the ocean and never sees a bottom. Never sees the top of the ocean, never sees the bottom. It's a parasite. It finds these gelatinous organisms called salps that look like barrel-shaped jellies. It kills them, eats them, and crawls inside and lives inside their body, right? And so uh, it's a pretty wild creature. How big do you think this is? About this big, this big, this big? It's about that big, right? Are you talking about the little white fuzzy thing or the big? I am thing? talking about this whole widget is about the size, maybe a little smaller, about half your thumb. And then what's the fuzzy part? Oh, that's probably, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to guess that that's part of its nervous system and its gut would be my guess. And this is an entirely transparent organism. That's a great question. Um, a lot of deep sea organisms are transparent, makes it harder to see them, right? Um, but what's the one thing you can't hide? What you eat, right? This is not Wonder Woman's jet. Things don't magically disappear. Uh, so oftentimes you see their stomach uh, filled with foodstuffs that aren't transparent. This is one of my favorite. It's a juvenile glass squid. Also lives in the midwater. It's called a cranchid squid. Um, not only can you not hide what you eat, but anything that has vision forming eyes, those eyes will be visible because you can't have an invisible eye pigment. Doesn't make any sense, right? This is one of the creepiest organisms I've ever seen. This is called a barrel-eyed spookfish. Um, let me hop over here, uh, and I'll come back to uh, the computer in a second, but what's this here? It's its mouth. What are those? Nope, that's its nose. Those are its eyes. Its eyes are located inside a transparent skull, and they can pivot from looking up to looking forward. Okay? This is a fish called Macropinna. Um, there's also other strange and wondrous, wondrous creatures. This is the Greenland shark. This has been in the news lately because it's incredibly long-lived, several hundred years old. Uh, it is a very large deep sea animal. It's, uh, it's, uh, it'll reach about 20 feet in length, a little smaller than some of the biggest great whites. I think they're funny because they eat just about anything. People have pulled tires, license plates, boots, uh, and many other things out of their guts. Um, and so they're also a delicacy for, for um, uh, for some uh, native North Americans, and uh, they, if you don't prepare them right, they're incredibly toxic, and it has to do with the, the, the buildup of trimethylamines, if I remember correctly, in their tissue, right? So, lots of neat animals. Yet despite this, our knowledge of the deep sea and my ability to tell you these little anecdotes, there's so much we don't know. We've described just shy of two million deep sea species, and it's widely agreed that there's probably as many as 20 million, okay? Uh, in, in, in our ocean. So, so we're really just at the beginning of this. Uh, the deep sea is not just interesting for biological reasons, but it also harbors the mid-ocean ridge system. This is the world's longest mountain chain. And an important thing to know about this mid-ocean ridge system is it's the site of most hydrothermal venting and activity. Hydrothermal vents are very cool for many reasons, and I'll tell you a bit about them as I get to mining. But one thing that we are beginning to understand is that those vents provide trace minerals and trace elements to the rest of the water, right? And that is basically the ocean's multivitamin, right? So enough metals and minerals come out of vents that they're, they're providing those, um, those needed elements for surface microbes and surface phytoplankton that are the source of primary production that keep our ocean ecosystem running, okay? And so basically they contribute to planetary habitability. Um, microbes um, are, you know, very clearly critical to our biosphere, right? But we have a lot to learn. They're the stewards of our planet. They influence these elemental cycles I'm talking to you about. And we know that they produce half the oxygen that you breathe comes from marine microorganisms that are photosynthetic. So every time you take a breath, roughly speaking, half those molecules came from something in the ocean, not from a tree, 
They fix nitrogen, without which our biosphere would come to a halt. If you want to learn more about that, go talk to Wally. She and I have been poking around at this, and Wally doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, but we know that there are a lot of microbes in the ocean, and these numbers are intimidating, but it's important to put them in perspective. If there are 10 to the 27th microbes in our world ocean, um, uh, that's sort of the current estimate. And they weigh about 10 to the 15th grams. All of humankind weighs about 10 to the 14th. But I want to focus on that number, 10 to the 27th microbes. This is the punchline. If you place them end on end at one micron in length, 10 to the 27th microbes extends 10 to the 21st meters. That's 105,000 light years. That crosses, sorry, that crosses the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so just because they're small doesn't mean they don't matter. Right? So instead of calling them astronomical numbers, I think we should start by calling them, all these big numbers in our lives should be microbial numbers. Right? So what are the potential impacts of climate change? I have given you this brief tour of the animals and microbes and the like, and we hear a lot about climate change. I'm sure many of you in this room are much better versed in climate change than I am. Okay? What I'm going to tell you about is from the point of view of a physiologist, what are the things we have to worry about? In other words, what environmental changes coincide with human activity and the increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide? And what are the three kind of major ones that are going to impact life in the deep sea? So I'm going to give you uh, a tale of three here about, about the effect of warming, the effect of deoxygenation, and the effect of acidification. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of these and give you just sort of a case study of, the, of how it might affect organisms. It's not intended to be comprehensive, but I, I hope that you're left with a better sense of why warming matters and why deoxygenation matters and why acidification matters, right? So we'll start with warming. Our oceans are heating up. We know this. And when we look at maps like this, you can see the change in sea surface temperature in Fahrenheit since 1901. Now, I personally prefer my ocean warm. And part of me gets excited when I think about Boston having like a balmy beachfront. But it's a very small part of me because the price we pay for that is potentially very large. What does it mean um, uh, to, uh, uh, I'm going to actually start with this slide. What does it mean to increase uh, temperature? What, what, so why does it matter? Well, remember, temperature is really a measure of, of molecular agitation, right? It's about the movement of molecules. And that affects all matter, including living systems. And so we have evolved to regulate our body temperature for a very important reason, because it allows us to, f to maintain an elevated body temperature. That allows our muscles uh, to move more quickly than if we were a, uh, a, a um, sluggish reptile on a cold morning. It allows us to really fine tune our body's performance, right? That's something that mammals do really well. That is what having an elevated body temperature lets you do. But for organisms that don't normally do that, that are, uh, you may think of them as ectothermic, or the physiologist might call them poikilothermic, their body temperature changes as a function of the environment. Increasing the temperature means that you increase the rate of molecular diffusion. So things are moving into and out of the cells more quickly. And that, so our, that includes molecules that an organism is trying to keep out. Right? Things like sodium, for example. Uh, it increases the fluidity of lipids. Let me explain this a bit. Deep sea animals are, have evolved lipids, including their cell membranes, that function very well at those cold temperatures and at those pressures. But if you keep them at the same pressure and you warm them up, their membranes become very, very fluid. Um, a, a really good example is like butter, right? Your cell membranes, uh, this is a bit goofy, but think of it as your cell membranes work best when they're like soft butter. If you get too warm, it turns into a liquid and cells, like literally, you lose membrane integrity. And if it's too cold, they're too rigid and they don't function very well. That's this whole idea of maintaining this homeoviscosity in membranes, right? So temperature has this effect of increasing membrane fluidity. It influences things like equilibrium constants or how well your hemoglobin can bind oxygen, enzymatic reaction rates, and just metabolic rates. So what that means, in a very real sense, is that if you're a deep sea organism and you've evolved to live in the cold and in the dark, and you start turning temperature up, whether you, as an organism, want to or not, your metabolic rate goes up. 
Molecular diffusion goes up, membrane fluidity increases, right? So, and this is so, not something that these organisms have evolved in general to control because the deep sea is cold and it's been that way for a long time. So increasing temperature has very marked clear effects. Now we know the deep sea is heating up. It's not heating up as quickly as the surface waters, but it's important to remember that about 80% of solar heat is absorbed by the ocean. And while sea surface temperatures have increased by about a little over half a degree Celsius, the deep sea has risen by about 0.2 or 0.3 over the same time period. It's not as fast, but it's important to know that it's happening. So the idea that the deep sea is immune from temperature increases is false. It's easy to see. Now, most, but all, not all, but most deep sea organisms are poorly equipped to cope with these increases in temperature, right? And as I mentioned, though, that not only does it affect these physiological properties, but ultimately it affects their ecology. So it affects their ability to hunt and their ability to reproduce, right? It is a very strong environmental stressor. Now, some organisms are actually very, are better poised to deal with those changes in temperature. And I'll tell you about, uh, about those in a second. But imagine that some organisms have life histories that are in the surface water and also in the deep sea. Or organisms that may have simpler physiologies that are able to cope uh, better with those changes in temperature. Increasing temperature is going to sh fundamentally shift the ecology of the deep sea. And while it may seem like, well, that's not a big deal, let me give you a case study of just how um, dramatic those changes can be. A recent study came out lately looking at uh, organisms on the Antarctic continental shelf. This is about 600 meters deep. So maybe not quite true deep sea, but getting pretty close, okay? They saw that modest increases in temperature meant that these lithoted crabs, or what you might call king crabs, I mean, there they are, uh, are invading previously inaccessible habitats. So the slight increase in temperature means now that an area of the seafloor that was not accessible to these king crabs is now accessible to them. Now king crabs come in and they are doing very well with a slight increase in temperature and they're res resulting in a tremendous decrease in the diversity of the Antarctic continental shelf. And this was a paper that just came out last year in PNAS talking about how some groups like echinoderms, like these sea urchins, which are uh, renowned for eating the phytoplankton, that's what they, uh, eating the algae, sorry, Sea urchins graze on the seafloor and eat the algae on the Antarctic shelf. Some uh, genera are gone. They're like they can't find them, right? And so whether they're being eaten by the king crabs or outcompeted in other ways, a whole bunch of urchins are gone. Now that has uh, spillover effects onto the, onto the number of algae and so on. So it's unclear how this will turn out. But this is a really uh, uh, good illustration of the sensitivity of the deep sea to a very small change. Warming also leads to deoxygenation for, for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, again, I mentioned the increase in metabolic rate of animals, right? And thus they're consuming more oxygen. That's also true for microbes. I would say that depending on where you're at in the ocean, that is, ranges from negligible to being a major part of deoxygenation. But also it reduces the solubility of oxygen in, in water. So by warming it, we're seeing uh, uh, areas where we're seeing oxygen loss in the ocean. Now, this is a time frame when um, deoxygenation due to climate change is, is expected to become detectable. So essentially, these colors here say that by about 2030, everything in green, we should expect to see changes or decreases in oxygen. And, and out here uh, in, in the southern hemisphere, it's going to take a little bit longer. So anywhere from uh, now to about the end of this century, we should expect to see changes in oxygen in much of our ocean. Okay? The green color is not on the scale. Yeah, that's areas that it's uncertain, right? There's not enough data to really tell us. Um, but I think that the, um, so to put some numbers on it, we can predict that by, by the end of this century, uh, decreased oxygen in mixing, because it, uh, well, we should expect to see a decrease in mixing because of the warming of the ocean, uh, will reduce the oxygen load by 7%. And the volume of the ocean considered to be hypoxic, meaning below about 20% of its carrying capacity uh, will increase by 50%. These are pretty big changes in oxygen. Now, I want to be clear here. Oxygen is required by all animals, not all microbes, but all animals. Uh, from a physiologist's point of view, animals are kind of boring when it comes to energy metabolism. Like the way you make your energy is really not that different than a newt or a goldfish or an alligator. Right? I mean, not really. 
Uh, you eat something and you depend on oxygen to oxidize it and you make ATP. Um, microbes are completely different. They can do all sorts of crazy things, but even some of them are dependent on oxygen. So if all animals and some microbes are dependent on oxygen, you can imagine that decreasing the availability of oxygen does a few things. It could impose limits on aerobic respiration. So let me put it in, a, in these terms. You do fine as long as you're at sea level, right? You go to the top of a mountain, you get altitude sickness, and you're a little bit challenged, right? But there is a point at which there isn't enough oxygen in the air for you to live, and you would die. That's true in the ocean, too. It's actually a bigger challenge for marine organisms to get oxygen than it is for us. For organisms that breathe air, our big challenge is not losing water every time we take a breath. Right? But getting oxygen out of air is easy, but the, you know, getting oxygen out of water is a formidable challenge. You can imagine that the change in the oxygen concentrations will change the distribution and abundance of organisms. And I would argue that it's likely going to influence microbial biogeochemical cycling that's really going to change the face of our ocean. And in fact, while well, Wally was on sabbatical, this is one, one of the projects we keep kicking around, sort of orbits a bit around this. Once you start having areas with little or no oxygen, the kinds of microbial processes that take place change dramatically. And again, if you want a local expert, go bug Wally. I love, I love poking at Wally. This is, this is great fun. Um, okay, so let me give you a case study, okay, um, about increasing oxygen minimum zones uh, and how they're altering what I'll call midwater ecology. Let me explain this chart a little bit. This, this was a, a, a nice paper in the Annual Reviews of Marine Science that basically said when we look at X number of marine organisms that live in the midwater and we bin them into large taxonomic groups like crustacea, right, crabs and, you know, and so on, uh, and then um, fishes, bivalves, so scallops, mussels, clams, you name it, and then gastropods, your run-of-the-mill snails and sea slugs, right, you can see that if you look at their, the median lethal oxygen concentration, you can see that uh, as you decrease the amount of oxygen, you quickly start killing off crustaceans and then fish and then bivalves and you're left with snails. Now, this is a very coarse plot and you shouldn't assume that all crustaceans are easily killed by low oxygen because some of the most oxygen, um, some of the most uh, tolerant animals on Earth to low oxygen are crustaceans. It gives you a sense, broadly speaking, that organisms that tend to have higher metabolic rates tend to be adversely impacted. And in the midwater, where we're uh, off the um, coast of California, off the coast of Chile, and in the Gulf of Mexico, where we see these hypoxic zones coming up again and again and again, uh, we're seeing that a lot, of, we have a lot of fish die-offs and we see an abundance of things like jellies, midwater jellies that are prominent, right? And some people are fearful that we're gonna have an all jelly ocean. I don't know that I see that happening, but we're getting major shifts in um, community composition. And here's something that grabs many people's attention. This includes commercially relevant fish species. One of the things that we, uh, even as the scientific community, tend to forget is a lot of commercially relevant fish, their juveniles don't hang out in the surface water where the adults do. They actually swim deep and they do this thing called a daily vertical migration so they can avoid being eaten by bigger fish while they're shallow. So they swim shallow and they hide in the dark, cool, nutrient-rich waters. But if those become hypoxic, now you've imposed a barrier to their migration and it's, it's, it's very unclear what these hypoxic layers are gonna do to these juvenile larval fish stocks. But we do know we've started to see decreases in some in areas where we have high hypoxic zones, even in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a, this is a, 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 a pretty um, fierce response. Atmospheric carbon dioxide, now I'm switching to ocean acidification, right, is driving ocean pH down. Here's a picture of sea surface pH, right? And so again, it gives you an example that if, um, uh, if this is the sort of a, a mean sea surface pH, these colors represent the delta or the change in sea surface pH. Now, on a pH scale, every, um, when you go from pH 6 to 7 or 7 to 8, right, that's a tenfold increase. So pH scale is a logarithmic scale. So even very small changes in pH are actually meaningful because you have a lot of changes in these hydrogen ions. So that's what, you know, what makes water more acidic, and it's, it's challenging for organisms to live. At a physiological level, decreases in pH means the organisms have to work harder to keep the pH inside their body normal. And if they can't, they suffer from what's called metabolic acidosis. All of the proteins in all organisms, if you expose them to too much acidity, they stop working. 
And if you stop enzymes from working, you, you basically kill an organism's biochemical machinery, right? So pH is a big deal. Now we know that pH is changing in the deep sea. This is the deepest seawater cabled observatory in the world. This is called Station Aloha. It's off the coast of Hawaii. It's at 4,700 meters or so below sea level. And there, they've just been putting down pH electrodes, and they're actually seeing decreases in pH. 4,700 meters. What's astonishing about that is that people thought it would take a lot longer. People thought, okay, we're getting changes in the sea surface, but the ocean's huge. Remember, 80% by volume is deep sea. And people thought, well, maybe it could buffer most of it. Or maybe it mixes sufficiently slow that we're just going to get low pH on the surface and the deep sea might be somehow immune from it. But, but we're seeing this now, right? So that, I think, is a little, um, a little uh, noteworthy. Now, acidification is a problem not just for enzymes, but a lot of marine organisms form hard shells that are basically made of carbonates, right? And so it's a process called calcification. And there's been a bunch of experiments that show that as you decrease pH, you start, to decre you start to pull these carbonates out and you make these hard structures soft, right? And one way to think about it is like ocean osteoporosis, right? You're losing the ability to form rigid structures uh, across a variety of organisms. This process of calcification isn't just found in one group. It's not unique to corals, right? A lot of the uh, uh, other organisms, including mussels and clams and the like, uh, do this. Shrimp, scallops, crabs. And so decreases in pH make that hard. Now this is the subject of much investigation in the deep sea. Because I mentioned these deep sea coral reefs, and they use uh, this process of calcification to form skeletons. Some of them have these deep sea corals are turning out to be really interesting indicator species because they're so sensitive to pH that you can see changes. They don't just die instantly, but you see changes that give you a sense of how much the pH has changed by. And that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of work going on, and we still don't know the fate of these deep water corals, but they are, if you hear a lot about deep water corals these days, this is one of the big reasons. It's that they're sensitive to pH and are kind of like a, uh, like a living litmus test, right? They give us a sense of how much the pH is changing. Now, this process of, uh, of ocean acidification actually has another direct financial impact on humankind. And the reason I like to show these data is because I think it's literally unfair of us, all of us in this room, to expect everybody to care about the deep sea. Like there's this classic New Yorker cartoon. Any of you, have, have any of you seen this? You should look it up. It's, just, it's a, so New Yorker. See sort of two ladies sitting on, on comfy chairs, sipping tea, and one of them says to the other, I don't know why, but I just don't care about the deep sea. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, classic. And I think it's fair. Like we care about some things, other people care about other things. But I think you can count on humankind to care about humankind. And so I, I think it's important to show that these are not just affecting esoteric and cute organisms in the deep sea, but they're impacting our commercially valuable fish species. Humankind gets 20% of its protein from the ocean. And that's, a, that's actually probably a low estimate. Uh, so we know that uh, if we start impacting species that are sensitive to ocean acidification, like shell-forming mollusks, that's the oyster fishery, and clams, and mussels, and, and scallops, right, that we're going to start it reducing revenue by 25 or 50 percent. So there are real, there are this, this is, this is um, uh, uh, a real nice way to depict the sensitivity of commercially valuable fish species to acidification. It's to put it in terms of loss of revenue. Right? And so these numbers are, are not just uh, the pipe dream of scientists, right? These are vetted by economists and the like, just to give people a sense of what we're talking. So the punchline here of, of sharing these stories about these three um, attributes is that they're all affecting the ocean, right, but at different rates. So temperature uh, permeates very quickly throughout the ocean, but the ocean is basically a, uh, has a tremendous heat capacity. So it's going to take a long time for, we, for us to see big changes in the deep sea, but we're starting to see small ones. It so happens that the organisms are very sensitive to even tiny changes. Deoxygenation, I would say, is probably the one that happens most quickly, especially at this sort of upper ocean and deep ocean interface where we see a lot of microbial activity. Uh, and then uh, finally, acidification, we start to see that moving its way in the deep sea as well. But again, the ocean's very good at buffering pH, keeping it kind of the same. Nevertheless, organisms are very sensitive to these changes. The 
punchline is that deep sea organisms in general don't deal well with change. And the effect of each of these uh, attributes is synergistic. It's called the multi-stressor effect. And this is true for any organism, right? It's one thing for you to run a marathon. It's quite another for you to run a marathon uh, while someone has injected you with Valium, uh, uh, you know, or someone to be shooting a gun at you. So you can imagine that for life in the deep sea, when you're facing changes in temperature that coincide with decreases in oxygen, it's, it's, it's basically a situation where you need all the energy that you can access to cope with the environmental changes and the decreases in oxygen are, are likely uh, going to Im, you know, impact your ability to do that. So I'm gonna switch gears now, unless anyone has any questions about climate change. I wanna share a little bit with you about deep sea mining and try and leave enough time for us to, to uh, chat a bit. So should I head on? Okay, so deep sea mining. So I wanna tell you a little bit about deep sea mining and I call it the next generation because Deep sea mining was actually a really hot topic in the 60s and 70s. Now, some of you in this room are, are uh, I think, older than me, so you probably remember this firsthand. I will not point to anybody. But um, I was uh, being born in, in the 70s. I can tell you that uh, I, I recall growing up in a time where we were worried about oil and the like, but I don't really remember ever hearing about deep sea mining, even as a, a geeky kid in a geeky household. But certainly it was a hot topic throughout the 60s and it spilled a little bit into the 70s because throughout the 1960s, the price of nickel was going up. Now I bet most of you didn't know that and frankly, why would you? I didn't know that until a couple nights ago. Uh, and it was going up and, and it, because the price of nickel was going up, it meant that uh, there was a, a commercial driver for finding new sources of nickel. On the deep sea abyssal plains, like in the middle of the Pacific, there are these vast fields of manganese nodules that are produced by abiotic and biological activity. But they're about the size of you know, a baseball and they're chock full, well they're manganese nodules and they're chock full of nickel. And so um, a number of different companies started saying, okay, well maybe we can dredge these up, right? And, and if we can dredge them up, they're really, really uh, very kind of pure ore and we can extract the nickel and we have this whole new source of nickel. Right? But it quickly went away as the price of nickel decreased. Price of nickel goes down and nobody cared to do this anymore because it was darn expensive and it was the, um, the lack of technology. This was a not, in the 60s, there were no remotely operated submarines. There were no ROVs or drones. If you were gonna do this, you threw a dredge off a ship or you dove to the seafloor in a submarine, right? So there was nothing that was going to allow this process to be automated. But by the end of the 1970s, Scientists had discovered hydrothermal vents. I would argue one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century, at least in science. And by that time, while the interest in, um, in deep sea mining had waned, through studying hydrothermal vents, we began to realize that these were areas that were tremendously rich in copper and nickel, not, not nickel, but copper, uh, gold, silver, um, uh, uh, platinum, palladium, uh, a, a bunch of rare earth elements as well. Uh, and that was sort of brewing in the back of our mind as we began to study the vents more and more uh, and focus on non-commercial aspects of it. Vents are extraordinary ecosystems and literally for the last 35 years their um, biological and geochemical uniqueness has been the primary focus of vent research, right? It hasn't been commercially driven. These are entirely different ecosystems. They're not directly based on sunlight. I do feel compelled to say, don't think for an instant that the sun has nothing to do with this because every animal that lives down there, like I mentioned, we all need oxygen. And that includes the tube worm and all the other animals. And that comes from photosynthesis. So to say that it's you know, a sunlight independent ecosystem is hogwash. But this is a, uh, an environment where the chemicals that come out of the vents are used by the microbes to convert carbon dioxide into sugars. The plants on, on land here, they use solar energy and they take carbon dioxide in to make sugars, right? And the cows eat the plants and then you eat a cow and so on and so forth. And that's basically surf terrestrial primary productivity. In the absence of sunlight, the microbes down there do the same thing, but they use chemical energy like sulfide or methane or hydrogen. 
And any of you who've ever used a barbecue know how much energy is in methane, right? You take a match to your natural gas and look at all that energy. The microbes use enzymes to get that energy out without starting a fire, frankly, right? Uh, but that's what they do. And they take the chemicals uh, that they get out of the vents, and the oxygen in the water, and they fix carbon, and that supports this whole ecosystem. Uh, they're lush, and it's all based on this microbial chemosynthesis. There are giant clams, and when we say giant clams, we mean giant clams, right? They're really, really big. Uh, and even the vents themselves are extraordinary. This one, this is a vent chimney. This is a tower off the coast of Washington. Uh, and this one, I think, is smoke and mirrors. And it's a 70 meter tall edifice, right? 70 meters tall. That means it's taller than Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Just to put it in perspective. And all of this is an amalgam of metals. These vent chimneys are enriched in metals, right? They're not, don't think of them as basalt or like granite or any of the other sort of igneous or metamorphic rocks. This is an amalgam. It's more like um, um, a, a precipitate of metal filings that have, have sort of been sintered or fused together. And in there, they're enriched in copper, silver, gold, gallium, indium, cadmium, and as I mentioned, other rare earth elements like lanthanum and neodymium, right? And so um, rare earth elements are really critical for today's technology. And even as we keep talking about a green, greener world, maybe solar power and the like, like, we need all these metals and these rare earth elements to make our electronics. A car, the wind, you know, there are these rare earth elements in windows, in LCD screens, in the nickel metal hydride batteries, right? Catalytic converters, headlights, you name it. The wind turbines for wind generation, they use magnets that are two tons each, right? This is not trivial to find. And of course, the voltage controllers. And don't forget, 25% of your iPhone or your Samsung uh, is, um, is metals, right? Some of which are very reactive. <laughs> and so, um, so, 2 billion cell phones are sold each year. So the demand for these rare earth elements is there. And I'll spare you this list, but this just gives you a sense of how many of these sort of so-called, these are the so-called high-tech elements. And it's mainly a lot of rare earth uh, um, rare earth elements, a lot of metals, metalloids, uh, that all contribute to, our, uh, to making semiconductors do what we want them to do. So demand is up, and it's all over the place. You can read about it in the New York Times and uh, in the BBC and the, and the like. So this has brought people to ask, should we actually be mining these hydrothermal vents? Because they are so enriched in this. Like, why not? Why not hide, mine hydrothermal vents? We have technology today that will allow us to do that, okay? There is about 90,000 kilometers of vent spreading centers, right? In, in, in volcanic basins, and back arc basins, a whole bunch of these different kinds that potentially harbor kilotons of these metals, of these elements, rather. Now, the just to put it in perspective, the traditional production of neodymium, which is used in these big magnets and wind turbines and other magnets, is about 7,000 tons a year. That sounds like a lot, but really think about it. For the whole planet, 7,000 tons a year is not a lot. If we could mine the vents for neodymium, we could provide more than enough to absolutely exceed the growing demand. It's expected that we could mine anywhere from 25 to 35 um, tons of neodymium per year from vents, right? I, I, I believe that. I think that's actually a pretty fair number. So, here are some of the arguments in favor of mining, and I'll, I'll present more to you. But as you look along the ocean ridge system, you can see there's an awful lot of places we could mine, right? And it's deep below sea level, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other logistical reasons but if they're, that I'll get to in a moment. But if they're so abundant, and they're so enriched in these metals, and thus the energy we spend to refine them is that much less, why not do it? So here's a picture of what seafloor mining might look like. There is... Um, a few different, uh, a few different uh, uh, widgets involved here. So first there's a big ship, okay? And what the big ship does is it uses an ROV to do some exploration, go down and take a look at what's there, right? And then it uses what's called an auxiliary cutting machine. This is a basically a big robot tractor that goes around and breaks things into, um, into manageable chunks, right? So think of it as like an underwater chainsaw that goes around and says, I'm gonna cut slabs. Then there's what's called the bulk cutter machine, and this goes around and it's like an underwater, um, I don't know, uh, macerator. It takes those big chunks and grinds them up into uh, little chunks and sends them to what's called a collecting machine. And this is where it gets fun. 
you have all these little broken up pieces of metal uh, and they came up uh, with a cool way to pump this metal um, up through this 150 ton pump <coughs> all the way up to the ship. So it's metal ore and lots of deep sea water that comes up to the surface of the ship uh, and they, they run it through a big screen and they catch it all and they dewater it all the way down to eight microns. Anything bigger than eight microns is kept on the ship and then they haul the ship into land and they process the ore there. Okay? So this is to give you a sense of the scale of one of these machines. Okay? So there's a person, so they're pretty big. I like this picture. <laughs> so this is the, uh, uh, not the auxiliary cutting machine, this is the bulk cutter. So this is like the macerator. Uh, and um, you can see uh, that, that they lower these gigantic things to the seafloor and they go and they, they scrape and they capture the ore. Now advocates uh, say, here are the challenges of land-based mining, right? You, you leave a substantial footprint. Like nobody likes an open pit mine. I, I guess unless you like I don't know, maybe like rock climbers like open pit mines, but um, there's, most people don't want this in their backyard. Here's an important point. You impact waterways uh, in that um, you start diverting water for, for mine use, right, as opposed to other uses. Uh, there's the question of carbon emissions. Uh, there's millions of tons of waste rock. Uh, and then, of course, going back to water, there's questions about how you impact water quality on the whole. So they argue that some of the potential advantages of deep sea mining, and that these are, these are compelling, right? No roads, no buildings. We don't have to build any permanent infrastructure. We send a ship out with some robots. There's no overburden. That's the, the stuff that you take off that really has no kind of ore value. None of that there is to remove. You can have smaller mines. Basically, they're on the sea floor. You go strip these really uh, mineral rich sites, you grind them up, pump them up. Um, you can get three or more metals per site. That's almost unheard of on land. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really great because it's higher grade ore and metals, and frankly, they're lower capital startup costs, and you don't displace people. This is a big deal, right? So why not do it? So a lot of people, uh, this is a kind of a hot topic. Should we be concerned about deep sea mining? Some people say, absolutely, then we should be totally concerned. This is particularly relevant in the South Pacific. The first places that deep sea mining are going to take place are, off, are in the, in the um, national waters of South Pacific Islands. Papua New Guinea, the island nation of Tonga, the island nation of Fiji, uh, and those are the big three right now. I may be missing one or, one or more. But um, one company, Nautilus Mining, is at the forefront. They have gone to these island nations and they have invested in schools. They built hospitals. They bought them textbooks. They, they, they upgraded the internet and they're making major uh, headways socially by doing all these great things for the people, right? Uh, nevertheless, there's still some concerns, right? And um, while this is a bit of a busy slide, I just wanted to use it to highlight a few things. Um, when you, the devil typically lies in the details, and that is true here. And in the interest of full disclosure, I'm the kind of person who thinks that humankind is always going to have an impact on the environment, but you, you, I would suggest we're smart enough to, to discern, uh, to the best of our ability, what those impacts are, manage them, and figure out how much is, is too much. Like I would argue that that's sort of a good way to proceed. The mining companies have, have overlooked or have dismissed outright some really important things, such as the fact that as you do this mining, you end up producing a, a, a plume uh, of, of the metals that gets suspended in the water. Now, the counterpoint is that this happens naturally, and it's true. The minerals and metals that come out of vents are naturally suspended in the water, and they settle in and around vents. So their argument is, well, this shouldn't be a big deal. Fair enough. Some people say you're going you're to drive the vent animals extinct. I don't think that's true. Actually, I, I personally don't believe that at all, and so I have no concern about that. Vent animals are very weedy. They're fast. They reproduce. They're over large biogeographic provinces. I, I frankly don't think that's an issue. What bothers me is what happens up here. Even though you're sieving the water to eight microns, you are going to have particles that are eight microns in size, and they are reduced metals that are incredibly toxic and high concentrations to, to um, organisms in the surface waters, including phytoplankton. Now, I mentioned the, the vents are the ocean's natural multivitamin. That's exactly what they are. But the, the same reason you don't go home and eat your whole, you know, carton of multivitamins is the same reasons you don't want to dump a bunch of mine ore tailings in the water here. So these are oligotrophic, meaning they're nutrient-poor waters, and the organisms there, I 
guarantee you are going to be incredibly sensitive to this. But my guarantee isn't good enough, right? What we should be doing is studying the effect of eight micron mine tailings on the surface water communities. One of my grad students is doing this now, a number of other uh, uh, um, groups are as well. So I think that deep sea mining does actually tie into climate change because as we move to a greener economy, I don't see that reducing our dependence on these electronics. If, every, if anything, I see it going up. And this is part of the story that we need to think about. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna um, just basically skip through this uh, and just uh, end on, on the following note that humankind is always gonna have a planetary impact, right? And we have examples of how to manage our impacts well through a lot of shallow water uh, reserves and the like. And, and while we can debate the extent of, of uh, marine protected areas and so on and so forth, when people care about particular sites, they are often vested in managing them well. Uh, and you know, and like the, the, the Wakatobi National Park is a great example. It's 1.3 hectares of very well-managed coral reef, right? And it's because it, it, it supports the local economy. And I think that we need to start thinking about things both in terms of their intrinsic value, right? The fact that they're important in and of themselves. And this is what scientists typically default to. Well, deep sea fish has a right to be on this planet too, right? That's its intrinsic value. But that doesn't stick with a lot of people. So there's also this question of its, of its extrinsic value, right? And that is, what do these organisms do for us? And the processes in the deep sea are very solidly tied to surface productivity, to fish and fisheries, and to humankind's health. So I think we need to, to, to make sure that the dialogue we have covers sort of both, um, both grounds. And I'll just end by saying this, one of my, sharing one of my favorite quotes by Arthur C. Clarke that um, how inappropriate is it to call our planet Earth when it's clearly ocean, right? <laughs> so on that note, I'll stop and uh, gladly take any questions you have.